It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It is a monster Monday that we're dropping on a Sunday night for all of you to have for your Monday morning commute. Presented, of course, by DraftKings. Could not be more excited about today's guest. I think he's one of the best players in the NFL at his position. That's not even debatable. Uh, Really looking forward to talking with Darren Waller, the Pro Bowl tight end for the Las Vegas Raiders momentarily. It's a new week. You know what that means. New time to be the spread the word winner, the sponsor confirmation email winner, the YouTube winner. I'm looking for new winners. I'm looking at you, and I'm looking at the big show. The Big Show. I'm uh, really excited to talk to Darren, uh, who I met at the broadcast boot camp, I guess last month or a couple months ago, the Pro Bowl tight end for the Raiders. You know, Darren, it's funny. At this point, I know, first of all, thanks for coming on the show, man. Yeah, no problem, man. Thank you for having me. You know, at this point, I know your story, Darren, um, and your background and what you went through to get where you are. But I think there's probably still a lot of listeners out there that don't know, that don't know the background and just how improbable it is that you become what you become. And really, I think what shocked me, Darren, is how early your substance abuse issue started. Uh, Yeah, uh, substance abuse started for me at 15 years old, started with painkillers, turned into weed, alcohol, Xanax, cocaine, anything, really. Um, And, you know, it was just a way for me to kind of quiet things down in my mind and to, you know, retreat from the world in a way, a world where I didn't feel like I fit in or I didn't feel like I had much to offer. Um, So that just became a way of life for me. And, you know, once you become addicted, there's, you know, you can have good things and good opportunities in your life. But when that substance is calling you, uh, you're going to throw away good things and good relationships and anything really just to, you know, just to function and to, to feel that high. So, uh, yeah, it started pretty early on and it wrecked my football career at a bunch of different stops and put it in uh it was asleep for a while for at least a year, uh, in 2017, I got suspended by a year from the league. Um, but yeah, from there, uh, somehow made it up here. So interesting, Darren. Um, cause I think a lot of people would say, well, how does why does he need a place to to get away, or how does he not feel like he fits in? He's a star high school football player, and I think at that point you were in Georgia. Um, but just because you're a star football player doesn't necessarily, I guess, mean that you feel like you fit in. Uh, yeah, man, it's really about what's going on inside you. It started really early on as a kid for me, um, just you know, not feeling like I was black enough uh, around people that look like me, um, not feeling like I fit in in classes I was in. You know, everybody looked like was a different skin color than me in the gifted classes I was in. So it was just a lot of areas where I was like, it just doesn't feel right. And I use football as like a like a people-pleasing tool. And, you know, no matter how good you are, you're never really perfect at it. And those moments where you're not perfect can haunt you and make you think that, you know, the good moments don't even add up or even matter. So uh, yeah, it was really the complete opposite for me. No matter how much success I had, you know, I didn't really have any real confidence that came just from me knowing myself. So how did you, how did you, how did you break it? How did you beat it? Because it feels like most of the addiction stories I ever see or read, there's relapse after relapse. And it doesn't seem like a high percentage of people really make it to the other side like you did and stay there. Yeah. Um, I know for me, uh, me getting clean and getting uh, sober wasn't just on a conditional basis. Like it wasn't for me to get back to playing football. It wasn't to, you know, you know, make my name good again. It was really for me to enjoy life and to unlearn things I had learned to that point on how to deal with, you know, the adversity that I face in my life. And so I did it just for me as a human being. And I said, once I did it for me as a human being, once I saw that, you know, football was still in the picture, you know, the human being had the character development that was necessary to hold up the success that was to come. Because if I didn't take that time to just work on myself and kind of put football on the back burner, um, 
you know, success could have came, but, you know, the, the same pressures, the same stresses could have been there and I could have reverted back to old behavior. So it just took that time of, you know, putting the whole world on hold and willing to just sit still, go to rehab and do the things I needed to do to, to heal from my past. Did you at any point when all that stuff was going on, well, let me take a step back, actually. It's amazing that you had the success you had, high school, college, get to the NFL, while being an addict like that, that, that is unbelievable. I mean, that, that might be the most impressive part to me because I know how hard it is to make the NFL and yet you were able to make it even though you were a drug addict. Yeah. Um, I, that's where I just believe uh, God given abilities come into play um, because I wasn't taking care of my body. I wasn't eating healthily. Um, you know, I wasn't, you know, I was hanging around people that I shouldn't hang around. Uh, but still there was a path created for me through all of that to even put myself in the position to be where I was. So uh, that's why I have no choice but to believe that there's a higher power uh, that has a plan for me and that's guided me in the ways that I go because, you know, just my story just doesn't really make a lot of sense the way that it's transpired. Well, then you go to the Raiders and it seemed like Darren, I mean, I, I knew the name and I knew of you, but all of a sudden, it, it feels like you were an overnight star. So I guess the question, I the first question would be, when you were an addict, when you were having your issues, did you ever think, or maybe even when you were in rehab, did you ever think that you had it in you to be the player that you are now? Uh, to be honest, no, I didn't. Um, I thought that, you know, once I got back into training after – uh, I was working at Sprouts and, you know, just working on my sobriety. I felt like I still had the skill set and that I could contribute to a team, you know, in some sort of role. But it was never like me envisioning like, OK, this is what I'm going to accomplish. This is who I'm going to be. Uh, it wasn't really that. I just, you know, I, I came to the Raiders and, you know, Jerry, and they had Jared Cook there. So I was just like, yeah, like, let me, you know, I can form a role here, learn from him and continue to develop. But then they, you know, they let him walk in free agency and, um so I was just like, you know, it had me a little nervous at first, but then I just realized, like, you know, I'm comfortable in my own skin. I don't really have to do anything spectacular. I just have to be consistent at my job every single day. I just start treating – I can win one play at a time, and I can, you know, do that consistently for a day. And if I, I can come back and do that the next day and just keep it as simple as possible. And then you kind of look up in the end, and the, and the numbers start to pile up. So it wasn't really a vision of mine to be, you know, somebody that was succeeding at this high of a level. Yeah, I guess my question is, when was the first time, either a game or during a game, or you heard somebody say something about you, like I've seen quotes from Gruden about how good you are, when was the first time you were like, holy crap, man, like, I am legit? <laughs> you know, like, when's the first time you realized you you are an elite player in the NFL? Um, I'll say we played in Minnesota the, the third week of uh... – of the season in 2019 and they have a lot of really good defensive players uh and they did at that time and uh i had 13 catches that game and i should have and i feel like looking back at the film you know with some of the opportunities that were left on the field even with that i could it could have been like an even bigger game so i was just like okay like i feel like you know this is something that i can do consistently it didn't feel like it was luck it didn't feel like it was a fluke it felt like you know this is something that i can do you know, whenever given the opportunity. So I'll probably say that game. That's awesome. Um, and then, so obviously, 19 was an incredible year, 20 an incredible year. Last year, it just seemed like you couldn't shake the injuries. What what kind of um, injuries did you have to deal with last year and how frustrating was that? Yeah, it was definitely frustrating. Um, the first game that I missed was uh, the Eagles game. I don't remember the week exactly, but the Friday practice before that game, I got tripped running like a, a fly sweep motion behind the line of scrimmage by uh, one of our offensive linemen who was kicking back. And I kicked myself on like the inside of my ankle and I couldn't finish the practice. Like I tried to, but I couldn't. And then I tried to see how I felt on Sunday and I couldn't go. And then um, I came back, we played Cincinnati. I had a, bit, a pretty big game against them. And then the next week was Dallas. And I felt, you know, like I was gonna really explode that game. And then I got rolled up uh got my knee rolled up pretty good on that thanksgiving game and it was just tough man like that took 
five weeks to bounce back from. And it was like, okay, I can get ready for the Colts game. And then the first day we have practice that week, I get, I get COVID that morning that I wake up and I just, you know, I feel like death. And so it was a lot, you know, it was a lot of adversity and, uh, you know, it was frustrating, of course, because I felt like, you know, just even statistically wise, I was on pace for another thousand yard season and just, you know, just continuing to be there on a day to day basis with the team uh, on that journey. So, um, you know, I just wanted to be, stay mentally locked in and contribute any way I could come back. And, you know, I came back out there for the last game of the regular season and, uh, you know, didn't do much, but I was just felt good to be out there and to, you know, and then just get out there in the playoff game and just give it everything that I had. So it was a frust- it was frustrating for sure. It's interesting because I called that Thanksgiving Day game against the Cowboys, and in a weird way, it was clear their defense was designed to try to stop you. So in a weird way, I think it almost enabled uh, Derek and 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 you guys have some success because once you were out, they were like. Okay, now what do we do? And your receivers went off. There was like 48 pass interference penalties in that game. That was a bananas, bananas game. Um, So, you know, one of the things, uh, huge news with the Raven, uh, the Raiders, not Ravens, this offseason was uh, the hiring of Josh McDaniels. I, I was kind of hoping they would keep Basaccia. You know, it was a small sample size, but you guys, even all the distractions and the whole Gruden thing, you guys made the playoffs. I thought Basaccia deserved another year. What was kind of your reaction there and the reaction of the other guys uh, when ownership made the decision to move on from Coach Basaccia and bring in Josh McDaniels? Um, initially, you know, uh, we, we're all – big Rich Passaccia guys, you know, just the impact that he had on us and how he cares for us as as people. Um, you know, we really wanted that for him. Um, but, you know, we understand that, you know, maybe ownership wants a sexier name or, you know, a, a, a hotter uh, candidate. And, you know, that's just the way of the business. But having Josh here now, I really understand why they made that decision. Uh, just them, just the way that they, you know, through their journey and how they've been able to you know, play the game and at, a, at the highest level possible. Um, they're really on the details of things. And I feel like it's really a great challenge for us to step up and meet um, because, you know, they, they're setting a certain standard and they're not accepting anything below that. And I feel like that's something that we need, especially coming off of last season, having the potential, you know, to go further. I feel like this is a great addition for us to, you know, take it to another level. Um, And it's just starting with like the fundamentals and, you know, our red zone production um, and, you know, penalties and things like that. I feel like they're coming in and making that a huge point of emphasis. And I feel like that's going to pay off when it's time to, you know, play those big games in January and February. Speaking of the standard, you know, one standard I don't really understand, and I'm sure you guys talk about it, but it's the pay for tight ends, Darren. I mean, you know, honestly, like top tight ends, top guys, you know, you guys are like 13, 14, not you guys, not you, Darren, but the other guys like 13, 14, 15 million a year is Kittle. Whereas receivers now are 22, 23, 24, maybe even more than that. You know, I do enough games as a broadcaster that, you know, when someone plays against the Raiders, you are the number one guy that they're worried about. I, I see who they put on you. Like I see who's covering you. I see the coverage, right? <laughs> So I, you guys need a, you guys need like your own union. People always talk about running backs needing their own union. Tight ends need that somehow you guys got to break through. Cause I guess I don't really understand why the wide receiver market is so much higher than you guys because of what you do in the run game, because of what you do in the middle of the field. And because for a lot of people, you know, Kelsey is the biggest threat for the chiefs. And he's making half of what Tyreek Hill makes. It just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, uh, I agree with you there. I don't know how I can even uh, dispute that in any way. Um, We do a lot, especially the guys that, you know, that really, you know, can carry their team's passing games and uh, really carry that load. Um, We should have the opportunity to be compensated as such as certain receivers do. Um, And hopefully that does change. Hopefully, you know, the guys that are next in line to get deals uh, can really help break that through for uh, the rest of the guys going forward. But yeah, man, I agree. I agree with you. I don't know even know what else to say. That was perfectly said. Well, and then and then um, you in particular, Darren. I, I think you signed the deal a couple years ago 
when you know you first were a breakout star and now I'm looking and you know it was a nice contract when you got it and it's a good story but you're still and I know they have Devonte Adams and I know he's a good player now that you guys have him but your contract is still like half of Goddard and Kelsey it's a little bit more than 25 percent of Devonte Adams like I don't know who your agent is, man, but he's got to get on that or you got to fire him and hire me as your agent. <laughs> like you can't be getting 25% of Devonte Adams there. Yeah. No, nah, uh, my agent is, uh, is working on that. Um, uh, I understand it. Um, but I know if I, you know, focus on it too much, uh, it could take away from, you know, my job and learning a new system and just, you know, just continue to try to elevate and take care of my body in the right way. Uh, try to focus on those things and uh, let my agent handle that. And when decisions need to be made, decisions need to be made. Um, last one for you. We started the interview talking about your background. What are you doing now? Like, what, what are you doing now as it relates to what you went through? I know you have a foundation. Um, I'm curious to hear more about it and how anybody listening could, could be a part of it in some way. Yeah, um, just as far as my day-to-day, you'll catch me in recovery meetings in Vegas, like, uh, like the rest of the local people. Um, I still have a therapist that I talk to once a week. Um, I meet with my sponsor once a week. Uh, so I'm really in the work and I know that I have to be just because my mind can go left, uh, just with, you know, the disease of addiction and, you know, the roots that it's had in my, in my mind for so long. But, uh, yeah, with my foundation, it, we're really starting to expand programs that we're doing is this program called against the wall that, uh, allows people to go to treatment. Uh, for 35 days, but now we're expanding into giving them aftercare where they can have, you know, up to four months of sober living, outpatient programs, uh, getting them in areas where they can have group therapy. Um, so that's what we're, we're focusing on. You, there's a lot of information at uh, DarrenWaller.org where uh, foundation information is at. But yeah, we're really, uh, really expanding in the Vegas area and really helping out the people that really need it. You can also check him out on social media. It's at Rackwall83, two Ks. So it's at Rackwall83. Uh, the Darren Waller Foundation is also on social media. You can follow, find that as well. Um, awesome. Awesome interview, Darren. Really appreciate the time. Incredible story that I know you've heard it before, but really will inspire and help a lot of people. I think anytime someone hears it for the first time, especially younger people that, I mean, you are something that they could look to and say, if he can do it, I can do it. It's awesome, man. Really great to meet you. And thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, Ross, thanks for having me. Wish you nothing but success with the show, man. There he is, Darren Waller. Uh, Wow. That's one of the best interviews we've done in a long time for a lot of different reasons. That guy is awesome. Uh, This is my patented segue now for this ad read. You know what's not awesome? Getting your house broken into. So this is the second week in a row. That was my segue. Uh, At least people were tweeting me about it last week. At Ross Tucker NFL. Listen, it's all about Simply Safe. It's backed by the best 24-7 professional monitoring in the business. The monitoring plans are priced affordably. Less than a dollar a day. No long-term contracts ever. It's easy to set up. You can do it yourself in 30 minutes. No pesky appointment. You can even try it for 60 days risk-free or send it back for a full refund. More than 4 million Americans trust Simply Safe to protect their homes and families. U.S. News and World Report named it the best home security system of 2022 third year in a row. I would love to know the percentages of how many people have home security versus don't. I hope you guys have it. I I really do. Because as my listener, if you don't, you can claim a free indoor security camera, which is awesome, plus save 20% on your Simply Safe security system and get your first month free with the interactive monitoring service. Visit simplysafe.com slash Tucker to customize your system and start protecting your home and family today. Again, that's simplysafe.com 
slash Tucker. Tuck Stakes. Hi, Ross. Uh, let's start today with uh, some football news, obviously, but not the NFL. Let's go to college. Nick Saban and Jimbo Fisher from Texas A&M. They're doing a little sparring, going back and forth at each other regarding NIL and some accusations on recruiting. By the way, Brian, before I forget, how unbelievable was that Waller interview? Very impressive. Very impressive. I mean, that is crazy to think that a star high school, college NFL player could be a drug addict, number one. And then number two, you know, the fact that he still, what did he say? He, he still goes to, um, you know, meetings in Vegas. He meets with his therapist and, and who he meets with once a week, his counselor. Yeah, sponsor. I think it just goes to show that uh, obviously he's human. Everybody's human. Everybody can. It's not something that uh, can escape. Any, I mean, it can be. It can happen to anybody. And uh, I think he's uh, uh, well, very brave. But uh, you know, being able to be open enough to come on out and talk about that. Uh, you know, he's got a, a great attitude. That you know, his mission is to help other people. If he can overcome it, so can other people. And I think that's wonderful. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Um, so glad we got him on. Speaking of amazing, by the way, no, this is not a uh, a sponsor segue. That Nick Saban Jimbo Fisher discussion was wow. For those of you who don't pay attention to college football, first of all, you should. But secondly, we've talked on the show a couple times with Andrew Brandt, with Golick Jr. about NIL. You know this idea that college athletes can now get paid for their name, image, and likeness but it's not supposed to be an inducement or enticement to attend a certain school. Well, Nick Saban comes out and says that Texas A&M bought every one of their players to have the number one recruiting class. He comes out and says that, um, you know, Jackson state got a recruit only because of the money. And wow, I, I am really surprised that Saban said that in a public forum like that really surprised which just tells me he's very frustrated now i think he was really just doing that to tell the businessmen in attendance in birmingham you guys gotta step up your game you know the only reason why we lost some of these guys is they went to AM for more money they didn't want to go to AM. they went to a that's really what he was saying we need more money to be able to get these guys and then jimbo fisher uh he's not going to back down and I loved it. I love that he called a press conference the next day and he said, listen, he knows some things because the reality is if you're not that familiar with college football, especially in the deep South, a lot of these kids were already getting money under the table. It's just out in the open now. And the idea that nobody has ever gotten money to go to LSU or Alabama when Nick Saban was the head coach there is just so laughable that the fact that he would say that publicly and, and put himself in the radar of a guy like Jimbo Fisher, who knows things, as he said, is just beyond me. I, I am like stunned that Saban would put himself in position because Fisher could have really put Saban in a really bad spot if he started to name names and say things. Tux takes. Longtime Ravens punter. Sam, is it Sam Cook? Is that how you pronounce it? It is. I, did you miss the one above, Briar, uh, on the Jordan Addison? Uh, yeah, I, we'll do that after. Okay. Uh, anyway, Sam Cook retires after 16 years in the NFL. So 16 years at any position is incredible. Obviously, punter a little bit different, but still incredible. And biggest reason I wanted to mention this is the Baltimore Ravens posted a video of all his current and former, a bunch of his current and former teammates basically thanking Sam for what he did for them and the organization. It is really moving. It is really awesome. And it's why I tell people all the time, the Ravens organization is one of the five best in the NFL. I would say the Eagles are too, which is interesting because they're the two closest to where I live, but top to bottom, like their website, ownership, 
merchandising, football operations, um, really impressive. And the Ravens doing that video is just another example of why they're so impressive. Don't forget press box food on both of those, by the way. Yes. Good, Bri. Love it. I love when you contribute. Thank you. Tuck Stakes. Um, perhaps the best wide receiver in college football, who we've talked about before on the show, Jordan Addison, announced that he is officially going to USC. Well, this was the rumor when, uh, you know, it was talked about that he entered the transfer portal. There were all kinds of rumors and reports that he was going to be getting a couple million dollars from USC, from the collective, to go there, which is supposed to be illegal again. And I don't think it's a coincidence that he announced he was going to USC during the Nick Saban, Jimbo Fisher stuff. I think that USC probably realized if Addison picked them, that they'd be that'd be that would be the discussion for a while. Oh man, this is college football now. You know, USC reaches out to a guy who's on scholarship somewhere else, he's not even in the transfer portal. They offer him enough money that he goes in the portal and he leaves, which by the way, I have no problem with any of it, just to be clear. But you're not supposed to do that, right? You're not supposed to be able to contact someone and offer them money as an inducement to transfer until they're in the actual transfer portal. I don't think it's a coincidence that Jordan Addison announced he was going to USC when he did at all. I think he's going there because Lincoln Riley's offense and Caleb Williams, a quarterback, but the money they offered him, I'm sure didn't hurt. Tuck takes. All right. And last but not least, uh, before the weekend, uh, did you alienate yourself to a couple of Bears fans? Not a couple, a lot of Bears fans. What was what's the story there? I didn't alienate myself. I just I, I, it's at Ross Tucker NFL. If people want to um, check it out, but I just said get drafted by a coach GM on the hot seat, change coaches in scheme after rookie year, bad offensive line. Lack of weapons. The Bears are basically following the how to ruin a young quarterback script perfectly so far. These are facts. Like, I, Bears fans are much higher now, Bri, on my delusional fan base rankings. Like, what? what is the deal? I mean... He did get drafted by a coach GM on the hot seat, obviously. They have changed coaches and schemes after his rookie year. They do have a bad offensive line. Now, maybe these young guys will end up being better than we think. But right now, anybody, any offensive line ranking would have them in the last five, bottom five in the NFL. Most would have them as the worst offensive line in the NFL right now. Or one of the two or three worst. Same thing for their weapons. Most would have them as the two or three worst receiving core in the NFL. So those are, those are four facts that I don't know why. Um, I, I, I don't know at all why Bears fans got so upset. People get like so uh, territorial and defensive like I'm like I'm talking bad about their kid. I I literally tweeted that it was four facts. It's an amazing thing. And as I fo I followed up, Bri, I said it doesn't mean that Justin Fields doesn't have to play better and improve. He does. Also doesn't mean the new GM Ryan Poles should have gone for a quick fix. He shouldn't have. It does mean that Fields is not in a position to succeed. They might have the worst O-line and receiving core in the NFL in the whole league. I mean, wow. Uh, I, I don't get it. What I do get is how awesome our patrons are. Patreon.com slash RT Media. Highly encourage you guys to become patrons. You get a signed card or picture. You get to ask a question. You get to be on our private Slack channel. It's pretty awesome, actually. I'm on the Slack channel every day. And if you're an I Think We're Done Here member, 
for a hundred bucks a month, you get a shout out for your business at the end of every show. You have no idea how good that value is. Trust me. Pizza Boy Brewing, I was there last night. Delicious buffalo chicken stromboli and three grapefruit Murren rivers. Sportaculture. I want to do a giveaway with Sportaculture. I got to reach back out to that guy. Humanheadnyc.com. Steakhousesports.com. Go-Bangles.com. And Evergreen Economics. And MyFrontPageStory.com. Graduations. Weddings, anniversaries, which is mine with my wife tomorrow, 17 years. Wow, that makes me feel old. And Father's Day, which will be here before you know it. You don't, nobody knows what, what to get their dad. Get him an awesome story. You'll get your dad to actually cry. He will. When he actually reads it, I'm telling you, he will. Other than that, let's have an awesome week, everybody. Uh, college draft will be a little bit later post tomorrow than normal. I think we're done here. Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker football podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the fantasy feast, even money business of sports and college draft all available at Apple podcasts, Ross or wherever podcasts can be found.